This village of around 250 souls, which overlooks one of the branches of the Solimoyes, is called Misao, mission in English. Hello, my French friend. I'm pleased to welcome you here. I'm the village chief. Come on, let's go for a walk and I'll show you around. I learned that my host, who answers to the name Monato, was first elected village chief in 1989. Elections are by universal suffrage, and by law, no one can have more than two successive mandates of two years. So our friend has been village chief since 1989, with a break of two years every four years. We have a small village, but we produce some handicrafts. 52 families live here, which, as of today, represents 256 people. We make our living mainly from agriculture. Cassava, cocoa, bananas, acai palm, chestnuts, and so on. Many also make use of the river, for example, by fishing. But it is largely for their own consumption. In this village, there are only farmers. It is a pleasant village, but it is short of everything. It has little or no electricity. A single generator provides some electricity between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. There is no healthcare system in the village either. All it has is a small clinic which provides basic medication. It's the same in many villages in the Amazon, and so the state has provided this magnificent boat. It belongs to the army and carries doctors, dentists, and other social workers on board. It sails along the river from village to village to alleviate the shortages. It's a special day today. We're playing football against the Amerindian community from Barira. This match counts towards the official provincial league. We have a slight edge for the next game, but it's far from over. This time, the final score is 3-0 to the Amerindians. But it is not enough, and Misao qualify easily in the thunderstorm. The following day, I'm off to the airport to catch an air taxi to Fonteboa, a town about 180 kilometers upstream. I'm a pilot with a company called Amazon Aves Air Taxis. I spent three years at flying school in Curitiba, whilst at the same time studying aeronautical science at university. I finished my studies five years ago and have been doing this job since then. Air taxis are quite common in the Amazon. I mainly carry passengers, some urgent letters and sometimes cargo. The aircraft I fly are Pipers and AT320Cs. The flight to Fonteboa should take around 50 minutes. The storm is close and we take off in the rain. Victor has told me that the main problem here is the weather, which you can only forecast up to one hour ahead.
It's still pouring when we land. To pilot an air taxi in the Amazon, you have to adapt quickly to the unexpected. At barely 30, Victor has been doing just that for five years now, over an area eight times the size of France. It's still home to Amerindian tribes who are occasionally resistant to all contact with civilization. I'm beginning to notice that at this time of year, the rain often doesn't last long. As I get off the plane, I decide not to enter Fontaineboa. The further I travel up this river, the more I want to distance myself from these ever-growing towns, which are threatening already fragile ecosystems. I also want to meet some locals, people who work hard every day just to survive. And so I find myself in a village of barely 30 souls on the banks of the river, far from the hazards of the big cities. I introduce myself to Francisco, a fisherman who lives with his entire family in a hut on the water. It is the same type of home that I had the luxury of gazing at during my time on the boat from Belém to Manaus. I often wondered, when gazing at them, what they looked like inside. Francisco satisfies my curiosity by inviting me into the privacy of his home. I am not disappointed, quite the opposite. The simplicity of the place is touching. These few wooden rooms, where life is stripped down to the essentials, okay. are thoroughly captivating. My name is Francisco. I've been a fisherman for six years. It's quite unpredictable here. Sometimes I manage to catch enough fish. Other times I barely catch enough to cover the day's costs. There aren't as many fish as before. Stocks have dried up. It's a hard life. If Francisco catches a six kilo fish, he can sell it at the market for around six euros. But that is rare nowadays, and his daily costs, including petrol, amount to two euros. It is not always easy to make ends meet, so he also cultivates a small patch of land, which he was clearing when we arrived. His improvised farm means he can feed his wife and three children. As I leave Francisco, I feel like making a detour, so I asked the pilot of the boat I hastily rented this morning to sail down a small branch of the river, one of those famous Inguarapes. I hope to catch a glimpse of the amazing wealth of fauna that people have told me so much about. I'd love to spot an anaconda or any of the other reptiles that live in the water or on the banks of the river. It is a magnificent place, which reminds me of something I once heard said by a well-known presenter of wildlife programs on TV. When nature is as generous as this, only one thing comes to mind. Silence. This caiman fleeing into the muddy water brings me back to my senses. It's time to leave, because tomorrow I'm going to visit the Amerindians.